The first speaker this morning is Carla McManus. Um, I have known Carla for quite a long time. Um, we talked about her doing some graduate work at the University of British Columbia. She did her graduate work at Concordia with Martha Langford, who's a, uh, a very rigorous and good photo historian. Um, she now has a Shirk postdoc at Queen's University. She did her dissertation, which I have now read in its entirety, uh, on the relationship, the uneasy relationship between the photograph and lens-based practices and environmental matters. And she will address one aspect of that today that relates to the nuclear. Um, please welcome Carla McManus. Thank you. Got it. I would like to apologize for the, the, the light on the screen. Unfortunately, it's necessary to light the podium and uh, for the sake of the, the documentation of the event. So apologies for that. Thank you, Claudette. I was going to also apologize for that. But you know, we've all been there before. So hopefully, uh, all of you have seen David McMillan's work, as was shown in John's fantastic exhibition. So you will have these images as a reference only, let's say. Um, thank you all for coming on a Saturday morning. It's a great pleasure to be invited to present in, with such a fantastic group of people. Thank you, John and Claudette, for this uh, opportunity. Since 1994, Winnipeg photographer David McMillan has been repeatedly photographing the site of the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident and its surrounding exclusion zone, a region of 30 kilometers maintained today by the Ukrainian and Belarusian authorities. Picturing the abandoned landscape of the Chernobyl exclusion zone, McMillan's photographs sparked the viewer's imagination with images of decay and rebirth. In an interesting reversal, the exclusion zone, designed to keep people out, has become a porous border for the non-human, as animals and plants have repopulated many places once strictly groomed of non-authorized life. The transformation of human habitation to natural splendor as the embattled nature of our modern world is pictured overcoming the techno-scientific structures of civilization, reminds us of the long reach of history and of the different temporal and spatial scales at play. The tension in these images between future and past, between ecological adaptation to nuclear crisis and humanity's destructive impact on nature speaks to our current anxiety about environmental crisis, from climate change to the geological leg legacy of nuclear waste, and the human struggle to adapt or perish in uncertain times. In Macmillan's photography, the ruin of Chernobyl is balanced dialectically between a romantic rewilding of human failure and what Timothy Morton has described as dark ecology the acknowledgement that nature is inseparable from human action, politics, ideology, and aesthetics. Caught in an interconnected mesh of life and matter, history and geography. From the acceptance of ecological instability and complexity as normal, to the understanding of nature as intrinsically cultural is not a far leap. Yet nature as an ideological formulation of purity, continues to call to us like an intrinsic state of being or purpose. An other that we admire and long for from afar. The wilderness myth, as William Cronin has named the romantic decoupling of culture and nature, acts as a form of historical erasure, either through its recreation of the innocence in the garden or as a, quote, savage world at the dawn of civilization. 
The crisis of ontological certainty in nature, civilization, technology, and chronology has been a long time coming. Heightened by the economic development of the global landscape. As Jean Ignacy wrote in his rumination on the triple disaster at Fukushima, and I quote, there are no more natural catastrophes. There is only a civilizational catastrophe that expands over time. This can be demonstrated with each so-called natural catastrophe, earthquake, flood, or volcanic eruption, to say nothing of the upheavals produced in nature by our technologies. In this paper, I will argue that Macmillan's Chernobyl Exclusion Zone series resonates with today's increasing sense of ecological risk by picturing the past, present, and future as conjunctional. Drawing on the concept of the environmental imaginary, which informs the symbolic and cultural understanding of nature in its many forms. In this paper, I will enmesh Macmillan's images in their imaginary past, present, and future, with the hope that my small insights might help us all, in Nasi's words, to think in the present and to think the present. For Nasi, this means rejecting the understanding of the future as a condition of finality or an achievable aim. Instead, we must think of the future as, in Marc Auger's terms, a time of conjunction made up of, quote, current events which give a content to the future by occurring. Photography is an ideal medium through which to do this type of thought experiment, offering the viewer an experience predicated on the conjunction of time and space and fact and emotion, shaped heavily by our imaginations and sense of contingency which Barbie Zelitzer describes as the viewer's as-if response, our subjunctive reception of the image. The Chernobyl nuclear meltdown had an enormous impact on the global imagination, as people all over the world were driven to reconsider the risks of nuclear fission power generation, its relationship to Cold, arms technology, Cold War arms technology, sorry, and the flaws in human stewardship. On the evening of April 25, 1986, engineers working at the Chernobyl plant took some of the safety systems offline to run tests on the fourth reactor. After several hours of inattention, they noticed that the reactor core had overheated, leading to a dangerously high core temperature, which caused an explosion that subsequently set off a chain of reaction, or a chain reaction of events. Fire, nuclear fuel melting into lava, and an off-gassing of radioactive particles into the air, which continued for days. Before long, sensors in Sweden and American satellites had picked up activity in the region, and the whole world became aware that something terrible had happened. This legacy of risk and catastrophe plays out in Macmillan's photographs. As viewers are faced with the past disaster, the photographic present, and the future implications of nuclear toxification, on the landscape of Chernobyl and beyond. Macmillan's photographs of the plant, the city of Pripyat, and the people who once lived there, and the people who continue to live in the zone, demonstrate the devastating effect that the nuclear accident had on the local communities who relied on this major industry. In particular, Macmillan's images of Pripyat show a place left quickly and without consideration or hope of return. In what is perhaps his most famous image of an abandoned kindergarten room in Pripyat, Macmillan documents the decay of a classroom that would once have echoed with excited voices. Shot from the center of the room towards what was once the front of the class, the image shows there is little furniture left in the space but for some kid-sized chairs knocked aside. Upon one chair lies a forgotten toy, a soft cloth doll in slightly faded purple and yellow. Bare floorboards run vertically from the foreground of the image in perfect one-point perspective, creating uh, towards the foreground of the image in, one, in perfect one-point perspective, towards the center of the photograph. Yet the main wall, with its open doorway creating a dark shadow off to the right of the image, stops the direction of the eye. Moisture has done its worst to the wall's surface, peeling it back to its raw material. 
and leave strips of crackled paint hanging in discolored clumps. In the very center of the picture, a faded portrait of Lennon leans against the wall and floor, half hidden by the little school chairs and some pink cables that hang down from the ceiling. Lennon has seen better days. His face is torn open at his nose, leaving a jagged, gaping hole. And his eyes have, his color has yellowed like old paper. Nevertheless, he is recognizable. His piercing eyes and bald domed forehead, all that is needed to make out the iconic figure. The decay in Macmillan's images reminds us that time and history move on, even in the face of great tragedy and crisis. Devoid of people, yet riddled with references of so, human social and political life. After all, schools are the institutional training grounds of good citizens. Portrait of Lenin, October 1997, is a record of Macmillan's experience in this abandoned place. It is the photographer's presence, not the specter of children studying in the classroom, that perhaps haunts this image the most. Viewing this photograph of squalid abandonment, it is easy to imagine Macmillan setting up his large format camera, adjusting his tripod, and framing the perfect shot. The nuclear image once again reminds viewers that we will be gone from this world one day, as will Macmillan, leaving behind this image as a record of what has been a moment of catastrophe now past that continues. There is a deep sense of entropy in Macmillan's Chernobyl Exclusion Zone series, as the abandonment of human infrastructure and places once inhabited, offices, schools, and homes, leads to their eventual ruin. The seduction of ruins is, as Julia Hell and Andreas Schonle have written, quote, an experience as inescapable as it is old. Macmillan presents us with civilization's ruin as artists have done since the Enlightenment, as a reminder of human frailty and of ho the hope for a better future. For Andreas Huysen, ruins offer a, quote, promise of authenticity, immediacy, and authority by representing the past as glorious and engaging in nostalgia in the present. In the case of Chernobyl and Pripyat's ruins, it is the wreckage of nuclear positivism, scientific modernism, and techno-scientific control that is pictured, alongside that of decaying physical and social structures. The ruins of Chernobyl and Pripyat give us a sense of temporal dislocation while picturing a paradox. By showing the past, they also send us into the future through the contingency of the photographic image, predicting the decay of our own current society. As Brian Dillon so eloquently puts it, quote, the ruin casts us forward in time. It predicts a future in which our present will slump into similar disrepair or fall victim to some unforeseeable calamity. The ruin, despite its state of decay, somehow outlives us. In a series of images taken at a playground in Pripyat between 1994 and 2005, Macmillan shows a world abandoned by children, overgrown and overtaken by nature. Seedlings, saplings, and large trees bristle with branches that have never been pruned. Old and rusted playground structures, the kind that no one buys today because they're metal and coated in oil-based paints, remain upright but seem to have become part of the landscape. Fallen leaves, jutting branches, and ever-expanding trunks give the impression that something terrible happened to drive away all the fun. In one image, playground, October 1997, the viewer has shown the gray and faded remnants of a former playground, a space designed for children to run and climb, where the growth of grasses and saplings has continued unchecked. From the bottom of the photograph, leaving straight up into the wild space, a cement pathway remains the only surface not overgrown. Yet the path ends abruptly in the middle of the image, as if unfinished. Three metal tubular climbing structures stand in the middle ground, filling the image from left to right like soldiers at attention. They are shaped, ironically, into childish symbols of the modern world. A rocket to the moon, a slide across space, and a globe to unite us all. Their colors have faded away, becoming gray and rusted. Amongst the open structures where kids would once have contorted their limbs to climb between the bars like monkeys in the forest, tree branches have grown through the forms, 
jutting in and out of the openings, reminders of former, former arms and legs. The bush continues to flourish towards the back of the image, where breaks in the canopy open up to show the white back of an apartment complex, and the steel gray clouds of a sky overhead. An underlying unease is present in this faded ruination of childhood. What, is the, what has caused this wildness to flourish unchecked? Nuclear disaster, toxic pollution, displacement because of climate change or war? Is this the post-apocalyptic world and what kind of horrors are lurking in the shadows? Or is not the horror, in fact, the very thing that this toxic garden has overthrown? While on the one hand referencing the ruin of civilization, Macmillan's landscapes of Chernobyl and Pripyat also offer a vision of a wilderness reborn, the fantasy of a utopic return to a once pure state. Macmillan has written that, quote, the exclusion zone is a remarkable and surprising place, not dead and static as one would expect, but full of growth and change. Macmillan's representation of the collapse of human agency on this landscape can have both a negative and a positive impact on the imagination. To some, the thought of human civilization in ruin is a crisis in itself. But to many, the idea that nature can recover, can rewild, an iconic ruin as damaged as Chernobyl lends hope. Biocentric nostalgia inhabits these images as the embattled nature of our modern world is pictured overcoming the techno-scientific, a romantic battle between good and evil in the eyes of many environmental activists and thinkers today. These aren't sublime images of global industrial decay, often pictures of, pictured in photographs of deindustrialization most recently in images of economically beleaguered Detroit. But instead, in the vein of Aldo Leopold's land ethic, they picture for some an inevitable and ethical renewal of a land poorly treated by its human managers. The reversal of human habitation to natural splendor, the rejection of dominance to embrace wildness, reminds us of the failure of humanity's aim of transcendence, the dream of modern progression, which Embrace technology as a means to an end rather than, as in Nazi's world, a mode of our existence. As a result of his frequent trips to the exclusion zone, Macmillan began to re-photograph particular images, drawn to the changes he saw over repeated visits and to the opposing forces of decay and growth in the landscape. In an abandoned gymnasium in the, pal in the Pripyat Palace of Culture, a Soviet era named building once meant to glorify the heroic worker and now tainted with failure, Macmillan captures a scene of dystopic ruin, unpeopled and empty. Gymnasium Palace of Culture, taken first in October 1997 and then again in 2004, shows the slow creeping of new growth in what was once an institutional gymnasium meant for human recreation. At first glance, the two images taken eight years apart, appear emblematic of modernity's failure, the hubris of man, and the folly of progress, all the tropes that come to mind in the wake of human-driven techno-ecological disaster. Yet in the first image, we see the beginnings of renewal, albeit gradual, in the success of a tree shooting up from the rotting floorboards. By the second image, success seems assured as the building further degrades around the new life. By practicing a form of repeat photography, Macmillan demonstrates that change and growth are still possible as the plants and animals that once were controlled are now allowed free reign. As abandoned agricultural and urban land have become overgrown with vegetable vegetation, animals, including top predators, insects, and birds, have come to repopulate the exclusion zone, albeit at some cost to themselves. The implication of Chernobyl's toxic landscape on the region's plants and animals is something scientists and viewers have become increasingly interested in and is still to be determined, although a long-term census of wildlife published this month suggests populations are thriving. While Macmillan's images so show nature winning, they are colored by our knowledge that contamination is invisible, insidious, and inescapable. These images offer, in a paradoxical way, a sense of hope for the future of the planet, even as they represent the ongoing nuclear and environmental catastrophe. 
While addressing a particular environmental disaster, Macmillan's photographs of Chernobyl and the exclusion zone also act as a warning of what is at stake should climate change or any other major environmental threat take full hold, as well as a question regarding how we will survive. They ask us to consider how humanity will adapt and what will be lost. The photography of risk, whether it's the risk of nuclear apocalypse or climate change, depends on the viewer's ability to translate images of the present into emblems of future threat, to imagine the future of the world when armed only with the knowledge of the past and present. Just as nuclear risk continues to be invisible, insidious, and often visually banal until the very moment of crisis, climate change requires the acceptance of an invisible and contingent risk on behalf of the viewing public. Through the work of imagining the future, we need to also imagine the future of our nuclear landscape in, an ongoing climate in the ongoing climate change discussions of politicians, environmentalists, artists, and multiple publics. Macmillan's repeat photographs don't promise scientific objectivity or usable data, as much repeat photography tries to do. Instead, they reveal the photographer's deep engagement with a place that is ever-changing. Macmillan's continued fascination with Chernobyl is a quiet commitment to a site of significant importance to the world. His images suggest that the recording of this transformation is more than enough as a visual response to the conjunction of past, present, and future. Macmillan's photographs could never tell the whole story of the devastating Chernobyl accident, nor do they provide answers to our ongoing problems of anthropogenic climate change. They do offer the viewer a chance to actively imagine the future through the viewing of past events in the present. More importantly, they prick the imagination and present contingency as part of the image, offering a darkly hopeful what if for the future of the Earth. They ask, what does the rewilding of Chernobyl mean for the future of the site, of humanity, of the planet? Through their temporal conjunction, to repeat again Nancy's call, they offer us a way to think in the present and to think the present. Thank you. Well, I, I want to ask uh, Carla uh, about uh, David McMillan's repeat trips to Chernobyl, uh, to, to the Chernobyl site. And, um, <coughs> I mean, this is a kind of question I've always had for him, but seeing how you're, you know, <laughs> right. I'll, I'll pose it to you, and that is, you know, how often do you go back? Um, I know he's actually gone back, I think, uh, eight or nine times. But I, I mean, yeah, it's it? more than that. I, I thought it was more like 15. Were you saying eight, 18? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. Almost every two years, sometimes every year since 1994. Um, but it is an interesting, I mean, it's such a great project, but it is an interesting kind of, um, you know, just open-ended question in that uh, change continues, yeah. the, the, the growth of the environment continues, and, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of um, a kind of witnessing project that keeps going back to see what has changed again. Um, and it, you know, it will always be changing, so it's... it's yeah, we were talking about this earlier, the question of, um, you know, when might David stop going back? Um, and as far as we've discussed, he and I, he'll keep going until he stops being interested in, in going. Um, that's sort of his answer at this point. And what um, I think is important to know about his work, which I didn't really talk about, is that he has thousands of images that he's never printed, never shown. And his work has been shown, you know, he, here and there, and it's in John Show, and recently it was shown at the National Gallery, but often it's um, a series of similar images that he selected, you know, as images that he likes to show, but there, there are thousands of them that are in this database, basically. Um, that he creates, and uh, he he doesn't have a big coffee table book, and he you know he just worked away at this project, sort of uncaring as far as whether people were interested or not, in a way. 
Um, but yeah, the, I'll end there. Unless you want to add something to that, Blake. I was just really struck by um, what you said about stories changing the brain and your repeated references to emotional coolness and once you related that to the exhibit space. Um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm just wondering about your decision to omit images and um, to do this very performative, affective kind of storytelling and to select song uh, to a way, in a way, to accompany that. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit about affect and maybe is it the oversaturation of images that led you to make that decision? And do we need that kind of connective storying of images? Right. Well, that, was that your decision? It's, it's, it's interesting because in a sense it's a kind of accidental choice because Peter and I don't usually use images. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm here really as a writer, not a, not a photographer, although, of course, the question of the theater and the performative comes up always. Uh, so it wasn't, it, it, we were more noticing this is an interesting phenomenon to be in a, in a situation where always there are images, and although, of course, usually any conference I go, I'm usually the only one that doesn't have PowerPoint. So I, Yes, we, Peter can speak to it too, but I, for me, it, it is a choice to be with language and bodies uh, and, and, and remember what that's like. Uh, the question of, the, of, of sound is also, um, I, I just really wanted them to come. And it wasn't really more than, let's give John a taste of this. Um, and it was, they were so generous to agree to come and do it. So it, it, I, I have to think through what that then means. It's really interesting to think through what it then means. I've had the experience in the last year or two of starting to work with psychologists who do a lot of brain science. And it, it was really, and, and it's the most rudimentary entry into it that's possible. But my understanding that if I spend an hour with you and you are listening to me and engaging with me and I've watched videos of, or, you know, footage of small children doing this with psychologists, that not only do you feel a little better because you were listened to, but your your brain, you know, you, pr you guys probably know more about this than I do, but your your brain actually is changed by that experience. So I think we're all storying all the time. This, this all yesterday was story, um, and story includes images and language, uh, different languages. But I think it's very interesting that this that this stuff about the brain is actually suggesting that that there's more biophysicality to to hope than maybe we thought. So I don't think, I'm not sure what kind of response that is for you, but. Speak to it. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I have really um, anything important to add, apart from to, to say that it, 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 it seems to me that in this, in this context here of what we were doing specifically today is that song is much more continuous with story in this sense, and an image in this, in, for, for us here, would have amounted to some kind of an instruction, right? And, and, and which was precisely what we didn't kind of want to do. But yeah, that's... Um, thank you for this wonderful performance, uh, Julia and Peter, and thank you, Carla, for your presentation. First, um, um, also very insightful. Um, question for Carla, uh, and then a million questions for Peter and Julia, but I'll have to reduce the million to one. Um, um, Carla, um, number one, uh, you showed pictures over um, of uh, David McMillan's photo because it's repeated photography, right? So I would like to know how you frame or how you, uh, what is your, um, how, how do you think about the nuclear uncanny in those photographs? You mentioned repeatedly the haunting quality of these um, pictures, but is it only haunting? Um, and how do you define the nuclear image, what is your approach to the nuclear image? It's a difficult question. Very 
uh, because uh, nuclear uncanny de designates, of course, Joseph is the one uh, who um, who invented it. But um, it's uh, it designates a lot of things. So how do you uh, how do you place those photos uh, in the context of nuclear uncanny? So what is the nuclear uncanny for you? And nuclear image and questions for um, I would have a million, but I, I said um, it, it was a wonderful performance. Um, I would that's, like. That's like yeah, and then, and shall I, shall I ask the question? So I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, agnosia about uh, in uh, Peter's, uh, Peter and Julia. Um, agnosia in the context of Fukushima, uh, what is being forgotten? Um, uh, in Fukushima, is it Japan's own nuclear history? Uh, what what other amnesias uh, are there? Um, and what is, uh, what is it that you, the topicness and the hexa hexatus, uh, this is thisness, so what, what did, the, the, what did the, the topistics of your travel, of your being in Fukushima uh, animate for you or reactivate for you uh, or made it, made it more effective? Okay, sure. Um, I'm going to answer that question a little bit by sidestepping it um, and, and talk about my experience of writing this paper, um, you know, how informed it was by what had happened at Fukushima. So I guess the reason I point to that is that for me, there, there's such a strong haunting in this paper of the events that most recently happened. Um, and my responses to Fukushima were so strongly informed by the work that I was doing on environmentalism and photography while working on my dissertation and questions about um, how images communicate to audiences to how nuclear images communicate to audiences today. So for me, a nuclear image is as much an image about climate change as it is about um, a, a person's individual response to nature, I guess. So there's, that's certainly the feeling I have today. And David McMillan's images are just fit in so beautifully with this sense I have of how our shifting kind of environmental consciousness mm -hmm. or unconsciousness has become concerned not just with nuclear or not just with um, disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, it, who wants want the mic? Olivia's question? There's just one hand, so I wonder if you want to. Oh, why don't you, if you've got anything to say to Olivia's question, go ahead. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll take some more questions. The, the, the kind of the immediate answer when you ask what, what registered for us is, is what we just read, really, right? I mean, I think we could probably keep going for a long time. We have so much material, you know, how it is with this sort of experience, right? So that's my, my, I don't mean to be kind of coy, but that is kind of my first response is these are the pieces that we're starting to register. In terms of um, what is erased or what, you know, what is, the inability to see or register, that's going to be so different for everyone's relationship with anything and with the event. And for me, it really is our friend Aya's comment, everyone comes for the trauma. So the erasures that I'm interested in in all of this work are agency, beauty, hopefulness, resilience, uh, without being Disneyland about it. it. You know, how do we hold these things together at the same time? Um, and I was also, because I brought it up in reference to the Dene, I was, I am very interested in trying to understand Peter and I, for example, who've been all over the bloody planet but haven't been to Port Hope, which is right next door. At least not really, not really been. So we were talking about this and saying, well, why? So when we were trying to understand, you know, the, the, the Dene not being in the exhibit, really, I think it's a really complicated, interesting question that's not about the exhibit at all or any, any particular political moment for anybody in making decisions, but it, it's a much larger question of 
what do we see and not see, and how do we even understand whether we're, we have the ability to see what we don't see? Yes, I'd like to ask uh, Carla about um, David McMillan's work. I, I haven't yet seen the um, art exhibition, which I will do, but does David also provide any text that goes with the images? Because I was really intrigued about the stories behind the images. For example, with Sergei, uh, why is he holding those mushrooms and what is he gonna do with them? I mean, I was just going to eat them. Really, but are are they not contaminated? Uh, so, I, so I mean, there are stories there that yeah. are actually no. David doesn't really provide. Um, oh my gosh, much context. You know, as as a photographer, I don't want to speak for him, but I I would say that I think he sees the images speaking for itself, and his titles provide information and that's as much as he wishes to provide and that that's a conceptual decision that that he makes um, you can visit his website um, and he does have some maps and and more information um, where he sort of has an artist statement but he he's he's a very kind of um, formal photographer he's drawn to the image making process and Chernobyl for him is very much his response to Chernobyl is driven by his his experience of seeing it. So, yeah. um, first of all, I don't agree that you didn't have any images in your presentation. It was loaded with images. So, so much for that. Um, uh, Peter, you, you promised to deliver uh, something about, or you asked out loud, uh, wh what are the roots that join Fukushima with Hiroshima? Uh, if you s gave the answer to that, I, I didn't get it, um, but maybe you just alluded to it. But c could I just propose uh, what I think joins those two and Chernobyl is the presence of the unearthly energy of annihilation. And that's why um, uh, the Chernobyl pictures aren't simply pictures of nature coming back after catastrophe. It's like it's, it's, it's over when you have that annihilation occur uh, that doesn't ever occur on Earth until the atomic age. So there's something really profoundly uh, attractive, mysterious, and dark about that this is where that annihilation occurred and oh look there's other things sort of coming back but it's uh could that be the root peter uh, well, I, mean, I, would, I would say to you that it's entirely earthly you know it that that is not about unearthliness and and, and i think that's kind of a, a theme that winds its way through what we were doing here is we're trying to kind of think about this I mean, this be for, from my point of view, this writing began with a, an idea that I, I would like to develop, which isn't at all here, really, but that every image emerges from the ground in one way or another. And I, I think so we're really, we're, we're talking here about the ground, whether we're talking about falling in a well or trying not to, vis-a-vis -vis the predicament of theory, or thinking about the, the status of the ground or our relation to it is like, these are incredibly earthly things that we're dealing with. So it is, you know, to, to reframe that, that question, I would say, you know, if there's, it's an earthliness, in some sense, it is really an earthliness that, that connects Hiroshima, Fukushima, and Chernobyl, and, 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 right? Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it comes back to the thing that we talked about, you know, early in the summer about, you know, this, the kind of the myth that, that, you know, plutonium wasn't part of the planet, that it was somehow an invention that comes after the fact, right? Does that kind of get anywhere near toward answering? Uh, no. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Julie? <laughs> There's a question here, right? Jamie? Oh, okay. Uh, no. Oh, it was you. I'm sorry. Uh, Kathy. Katie. Katie McCormick. Forgive me, Katie. I'm going blind. 
Thank you. Um, I was interested in, in, I think Julie said, um, in relation to Fukushima, Hiroshima became safe. It's that notion of safe. And in both um, reflections, the, um, the recuperation of these places of, you know, sort of original disaster. It's like the, the baptism by fire of Hiroshima, you know, the birth. I mean, of course, after, you know, Trinity. But um, the way in which it's recuperated and come back and become beautiful, and that each of these monuments encapsulates some memory, but that now it's thriving, it's alive. And um, with Chernobyl, again, David's visit and, you know, revisiting reminds us again and again, this place is alive. So it's just interesting and wanted you to maybe uh, just comment on that, that terrible paradox of these places of original destruction, which almost become, uh, and dare I say it, nostalgic now, that they've, uh, they're almost precious. And I, you know, I say that in a, in a kind of uncomfortable way yeah. uh, because I struggle with it in my own photography of Hiroshima which is beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just realized, yeah, I've seen your photography. Yeah, you presented at Ryerson a few months ago. Yeah, OK, so hello. <laughs> I'm really struck by the language that we are stuck with, perhaps not stuck with. But so <clears throat> when Blake asked the question, why does David keep going back? I was thinking back, it's such an interesting word. You know, Hiroshima has gone back to being beautiful, <clears throat> and yet Every time David visits Chernobyl, something's going forward. So isn't he going forward over and over? And I, I, I think what matters to me to try to hold in some experiential way and some you know, thinking way is that Hiroshima always was beautiful and terrible. <laughs> Not to the extent, the catastrophic extent that Bob's reminding us of, but when Aya says everyone comes for the trauma, it's not that the trauma's over, it's that there's this vibrant life in Fukushima City, for example, restaurants are full of people, uh, every day you have to read about which vegetables it's okay to eat or okay to eat. So it's, it's the somehow the conjuncture of all of it together, which is maybe a little bit about this thing of us all living together in this, you know, what, what James was talking about. I don't know, yesterday I've been thinking about it ever since, living inside this big computerized internet thing. So here we are, nevertheless, together, you know, struggling to have some sort of foolish contact with each other and some continuing to grow and nurture. And I, so I don't know if I'm answering you at all, Katie, but it's, it, to me, it is, it is a fight against nostalgia, absolutely. The sort of sentimentalizing of tragedy is one of the things I hate and sort of try to make sure I'm not doing, but then I'm inevitably going to do it because it's also reception, right? But I, yeah, I, maybe that's enough. But I, I, I think the thing of what it is to go back, what's, it's, it's not restored. And I think of Keo yesterday talking about consolation. You know, maybe it's not about consolation. Maybe it's something else. Okay, thanks everybody. This has been so enjoyable. Um, Carla, I have a question for you about this parallel that you're drawing between um, imaging Chernobyl and imagining anthropogenic climate change. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the romance of imaging the world without people is really seductive. And um, I'm wondering how you see this as hopeful, because you talked about a dark hopefulness, but that certainly would allude to a hopefulness for nature taking over after the violence of people being annihilated. So I worry about that parallel. Mm. Um, and couldn't this also be an excuse for sort of perpetuating or this dithering that's going on as far as addressing climate change if we're sort of take heart, you know, the environment can do this. It can, it can be beautiful again in this way, even though we we can't see how toxic it is and that, all this other yeah. stuff. So I uh, just yeah, wonder sure. if you could respond to that. Um, well, that's what I, say. What, I, what I did here was an exercise in personal reception, right? So what I was trying to do was really draw 
all the different responses that I feel in, in David's work. So one of them being this tension between my feeling of hopelessness in humanity, right? That maybe we should just clear off and let the land recover. And then, of course, my feeling of personal responsibility as a human to, to humanity. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that David's work brings those up, both those issues up. So I, I hope I wasn't endorsing a kind of um, radical environmentalist uh, stance while at the same time acknowledging that I think um, that's a feeling people will have in looking at this work. Um, as far as your, your second comment, um, I, I hope that by bringing up Nancy's kind of provocative notion of being in the present and being present, I could sort of evoke the, the necessary work that we do need to do today, which is to take responsibility for today as far as, as any kind of uh, imagining of the future to imagine a future without understanding the present's role in the future is impossible. So I hope that um, this exercise that I engaged in in kind of drawing out the environmental imaginary helped people to think about the various different types of responses at play without necessarily endorsing one or the other. But we could talk more later. <coughs> This gives me an opportunity to say this is Susan Chukli, who is the next speaker. And the reason we've gone on a little bit longer here um, is that there's just going to be one speaker, and that would be Susan, after the break. Um, and then we'll break for lunch. So that's why I extended this for an extra 15 minutes. Those who are looking at the time schedule. Susan Chukli, please. Oh. Okay. Thanks, John. I just wanted to follow up on this sort of train of questioning, because I was um, reading various reports on the forests at Fukushima and also at Chernobyl, and in some way, when I think those images de of a kind of regenerative growth of nature, they, it's a false image because it's a radically different kind of uh, forest that has developed in, um, subsequent to 1986. So it isn't the return of the real in any sense of that um, imaginary. And, and so, and I was really struck when I was in the Fukushima uh, Daichi Prefecture at the kind of um, kind of relentless attempts to kind of re-engineer um, natural ecosystems in terms of removal of topsoil in the Atati Valley, etc. So I guess my question is a bridge between the two presentations around trees and when Peter mentioned the trees that had been re, uh, reoriented and therefore their kind of role as witness had been uh, you said realigned, I believe is the word that you kind of used and. In some way, that realignment for me is actually kind of um, not so much a transgression, but a kind of um, testimonial to the kind of radical realignment that is actually happening and is registered by uh, natural systems. And so that we actually have to encounter those, uh, something like a tree, as an entirely different kind of natural species. And we can't naturalize that in, in any sense of the word. It's, so it's a bit of a comment that tries to bridge the two presentations. And I don't know if either of you has anything you'd like to add to that. The only, Peter, the only, Peter, you, you go first. Okay. Because Colin just did a yes. All right. That's my turn. <laughs> um, I guess it, I mean, it, it also links in a way to the kind of agnosia right? and it, it, where, where um, these kinds of, just, just like you, as traveling in, in Fukushima, you, you're kind of always navigating these sort of culturally ratified false memories, right? In such a way as so you're trying to figure out sort of what's going on and, and this, the, the production of, of doubt as we uh, were thinking about uh, yesterday. And, and, and I think, I mean, the, the, the trees then become, become subject to the same kind of thing, right, in terms of, um, uh, you know, what their capacity is as, uh, as you know, natural subjects. And this is kind of what the master gardener was saying, which, which was, you know, it's like, you've got to be careful. You don't want to help them too much. You know, you, the only according to what their capacities are. Um, so there is a very funny thing going on there with 
thinking about trees and thinking about natural systems and what, what restoration might come to mean in that context when, in fact, you can't restore anything. All you can do is move shit around to somewhere where it happens to be you know, slightly less inconvenient to have. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the reproduction of these natural systems is a very interesting thing that's going on there. Uh, do you want to, like, talk about Chernobyl? Do you want to? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you do that? Either of you want to make a comment as well on this? Or is that closing door a sign? I, I, I think the door just closed. I, this is an yeah. extraordinary right. session. I'd just Thanks. like to thank all three of you enormously. And thank you. Yeah. Favorite duet from the opera. <laughs> Bravo.